Randy Kay here. We all go through struggles at times, and I want to share with you through stories and insights and interviews with others how much God loves you. He loves you immensely, and that's what I hope you will hear through our interviews and what we have to share with you. Thanks for staying tuned. Here we go. Hi, welcome. Today, my guest is Jeff Olson. We've been talking uh, prior to this interview, and I feel like we have a kindredness, a brotherhood between the two of us. Uh, you're going to really enjoy listening to uh, this dear brother, uh, Jeff Olson. Uh, he has such a tender heart and conveys the love of God despite having gone through a horrific accident. During this accident, he lost his wife, his 14-month-old youngest son. He was in the hospital for several months, broken bones, broken back, and eventually his leg was amputated. But the message he carries today is one that is profound for each of us that will bring us closer to God. So Jeff, it's great to have you with us today. Randy, it's, it's an honor and it's a pleasure to be on the show. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you. And I do want to make note that uh, there are four books that we'll make mention of uh, during this episode. The first one is one uh, that I thoroughly enjoyed, which is I, I Knew Their Hearts. That was your first book. We'll talk about some of the subsequent books uh, that you have, have authored along with the final one, uh, which is a children's book with your uh, son. But um, first, uh, I know, Jeff, you've told this story a number of times, but um, if we can, and I'll leave it up to you as to where you would like to start, but obviously this was a horrifically uh, traumatic event for, for you at the time. Yeah, it, it was traumatic, and I can, I can speak of it now. It, it took a while. I mean, early on, I, I mean, even for years, I, I would just cry. I couldn't speak of it. Now enough time has passed. Um, you know, grief, grief isn't something that you get over. I believe you get used to it. It's, uh, it's like carrying a stone in your pocket. It, it, it doesn't go away, but you get used to the weight. And of course, I've had divine support in, uh, in that weight. And, and I think, you know, to share it, it would be nice to go to the morning of the accident. Um, and it was the Monday after Easter, of all things. We'd taken a family road trip. And we had celebrated the Easter holiday, which I think is, um, you know, ironic. And yet there's no irony. There's no accidents in, in this divine plan. And yet there's always choice. But as we finished Easter and as we were leaving Monday to come back home, I, you know, we'd said our goodbyes. We were seeing my wife's uh, family, her parents, and we had hugged everyone. And I buckled the kids in the car and we were just pulling away from the curb. And uh, my wife said, stop, stop. I, I thought she'd forgotten something. And I put the car in park and looked at her and she said, I just want to go say goodbye to mom and dad one more time. Now, at the time, I thought, oh, women, you know, we've said goodbye. We're, we're on our way. But I watched as she ran up to the porch and she not only hugged but she kissed her mother and father and you know then she joyfully jumped back in the car and we buckled up and went but the, but the reason I want to start there and and I call them whisperings you know when 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 that little when the spirit gives you that nudge you know hey just go say goodbye to mom and dad you know stop the car I'm, I'm gonna go do this that's one thing I've really learned is when we get those spiritual nudges, act upon them. And, and she did. And, and as the day played out, um, that was the last goodbye. We, you know, I, I put the car back in drive. We headed for the interstate. I set the cruise control and 75 miles an hour was as fast as I could legally go. And I was pushing it. I was in a hurry to get back. We had a four hour drive ahead of us. And uh, it was about an hour or so into that drive that, uh, that things went awry. And there was, there was reports of crosswinds. There was reports of a red pickup truck driving erratically on the, 
on the interstate. Uh, one of the hardest parts of the story is I believe what happened is that I may have just dozed off. Just, just, I mean, I didn't necessarily fall asleep, but dozed off, swerved to the right, overcorrected to the left, and the car, as I lost control, began to roll. Not off the freeway, but but down the interstate at 75 miles an hour. And it was a horrific crash. I, I blacked out for the actual rolling of the car. And uh, I, I was told by accident reports, it may have rolled six or eight times. But when the car came to a stop, I was completely conscious. I, I mean, I'm, I'm like, wow, what, you know. And the first thing I was conscious of was my seven-year-old, my oldest son, crying in the back seat. I could hear his cry. And as a father, I'm like, wow, I've got to get to my boy. But that's when I realized I, I couldn't move. I was pinned either to the seat or the floorboard. I couldn't tell. There was the rancid smell of gasoline. There was all the broken glass. Um, I was actually unaware of my injuries. The adrenaline had taken over. Now, I knew I was struggling to breathe. I knew I was in pain. I was unaware that both of my legs had been crushed. And, and as you mentioned, the left leg eventually amputated. My back had been broken, but it had only cracked the vertebrae. My spinal column was not damaged. You know, thank goodness I, I can still move. Uh, my right arm had been nearly pulled off. My rib cage had been damaged and my lungs were collapsing. And then the seatbelt had cut through my, my lower abdomen and ruptured all my intestines. I, I was in a horrible state. I, I was unaware. All I knew is my son was crying. I wanted to get to him. And, and, and that's when I realized that no one else was crying. And... Um, I was aware, I was aware at the scene of the accident that both Tamara, my wife, and Griffin, my youngest son, uh, they had been killed instantly. Um, and that, that's the darkest place I believe I've ever been in. I mean, here I was trapped. I have a hysterical child I cannot get to. Half the family has, has passed. And, and I was driving the car. I mean, Randy, the guilt, you know, the, the grief, the regret, the, it, I, I, wanted, I wanted those three seconds back. What happened? How can I do this? Uh, can I rewind time somehow? And, and just the overwhelming trauma and, and grief and regret. Uh, it, it's the darkest place I've ever been in. And I only set that up, not to be graphic or, or morbid. But it was in that darkness that I experienced light. Um, I, I literally felt light come. And when I say that, when, when we talk about the near-death experience or the out-of-body experience or the divine, words are difficult. It's difficult to put into words, but light came. It, 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 it surrounded me. It embraced me. It seemed to be comforting me. It felt like I was rising above the scene of the accident. And suddenly I could breathe. Suddenly the pain was gone. And my, my thought was, how, how can I possibly be okay? That was my thought. How can I, what, what's happening? Now I was and am a believer, but to experience this was different than a belief. I was experiencing it. And as I came to you know, terms with, wow, I'm, I'm okay. And I'm being comforted by this light. My wife, who I knew was deceased at the scene, suddenly she was in the light with me. She was there and, and, and she was gorgeous, not, not to be morbid. I knew at the scene of the accident, I, she, you know, I, I, her life had been taken, but in this experience that felt very physical, but I seemed to be out of the body. She was gorgeous. There was no injuries. There was nothing like that. And, and yet she was emphatic. She was saying, Jeff, you, you, you've got to go back. You've got to go back. You can't come. You, you can't come with. You've got to go back. And Randy, we literally, we had a conversation. We talked about the fact that if I stayed with her, 
we were orphaning a young seven-year-old in the back of the car that at this point she communicated, he's going to be okay, but you've got to go back and raise our boy. And um, I learned a lot about choice. I, I mean, there I was looking at the woman I loved more than life. And yet I knew I had a little boy in the backseat of that car. And, and I've almost learned that for me, one of the most powerful cosmic rules, if you will, is free will and choice. I, I was to choose and, and we made the choice together that I was going back. And uh, I said the most profound goodbye I'll ever say. Hmm. I can't imagine that. Yeah, if you yeah. said goodbye to your to Tamara, the, your wife, at that point. Yeah, I mean, it, it was it. literally, you know, it was this is goodbye, and yet the profound thing too is, well, but you're here, like you're tan, like you're you're alive and well, and and so am I, and and so I suppose it was till we meet again, rather than goodbye forever you know, uh, and, and I, I, and we can talk about that later. I felt her angelic support in this whole scenario in profound ways, but we made the choice and I made the choice that I was coming back. And in doing so, once again, I, I didn't have to figure out how to return it. We have no idea how powerful our thoughts are, you know, the intention I'm going back and boom, suddenly I found myself wandering around a hospital, moving about a hospital. Now, I was still a little confused. I was in spirit. I was encountering the doctors, the nurses, the patients, and the families of the patients in a, in a busy level one trauma center. I, you know, I, I, I later found out that, that people had arrived at the scene. My seven-year-old was banged up a bit, but he physically walked away from the accident spiritually and emotionally he thought the whole family was gone um i had to be extricated from the car and because of my injuries i was rushed to a local hospital you know a remote small town hospital and they immediately life flighted me or airlifted me to the closest level one trauma center but i i didn't know any of that i knew i had crashed the car i'd said this goodbye and here i was wandering about a hospital seeing and that's another loaded word, really seeing everyone I encountered, the doctors, the nurses, and I, it's as if I knew them. It's as if, it's as if I was them. That was a oneness. That was a connection. And that was a profound knowing, if you will. I, I knew their, their love, their hate, their joy, their motivations, their decisions. And, and I saw them in a way that, that now I say I saw them as God sees them. And it didn't matter if it was the heroin addict or, or the saintly grandmother, there was this love. There was this profound connection. I even had a biblical verse as I'm encountering these people blown away, like, wow, <laughs> look at their life and look at what they're creating and becoming and, and what they're being, even in their challenges. And um the biblical verse was, was the famous, you know, in as much as you've done it unto the least of one of these, you've done it unto me. And of course, the master, Jesus, was, you know, was, was speaking that. And, and, and there was a depth to it. I'm like, oh, I thought that was a nice verse about being nice. Hmm. And yet it's like, no, no, no. He, he was saying, you, I am the beggar in the street. I am the stranger. I am the man in prison. I am that I am. And, and this is what I was experiencing. It was this connection of, of, wow, I see their magnificence. I see the divine part of them beyond the body, beyond their habits, beyond their mistakes, or even beyond their, their glorious life. I was seeing a divine part that, that I had never seen in my life till that moment. And I I was overwhelmed or, or, or in awe. I was in awe of that. And I finally came up on a body uh, man that I didn't feel that from, which I found interesting. And that's when I stepped forward to look. And I realized that's me. That's my body. I mean, it wasn't me. I was having this profound spiritual connected experience, but there was my body. There was my broken tabernacle and I knew I had to get back in. 
So Jeff, you could, basically you had this kind of assimilation of kind with others. You could see into their personhood as a, as a spirit apart from your body. But if I understand you correctly, when you came to your body there, which was apparent, uh, separate from your spirit that had been released from your body, your right. terminal body, that you didn't have that sense of life. You had a kind of a, a lifeless connection, if you will. Yeah, no, that's very accurate. And it, it, it was sad, actually. I mean, I recognized it. It was, it was sad and profound. I recognized, wow, that's my body. And it was so, it was so broken, Randy. It was, I was a mess. And yet I saw for the first time the miracle <laughs> that the body is. I mean, the miracle. I, I thought, wow, I, I never, I, I took it for granted. I didn't realize that I, I didn't have to remind my heart to beat or my lungs to breathe. I didn't have to teach my eyes to see or my feet how to walk. I, I, I thought that, well, in fact, it was, it was profound in my realization of look at my body. And, and I felt God, if you will, there was this mentoring, loving energy. I, I, I was told that is your body is the temple. Your body is the temple and your spirit must enter it. You must enter that tabernacle and, and live out your life. Um, but, but I realized what a miracle our bodies are. And even in my brokenness, as far as the body goes these days, every step is a miracle. I mean, it's like, wow, look at that. My eyes blinked and I didn't even have to think about it. It's, it's, it's a beautiful realization of what it means to be, to be mortal, to, to be flesh, and to also be uh, a spirit or an eternal soul, if you will. Hmm. And did you, when you were having this uh, out-of-body experience in your spirit, looking upon your body, and your body, eventually you went through, what, 15 surgeries or something like that? I, I'm told 18. My mother 18. was counting. Sorry, My, sorry. I, I was unconscious, a lot, but yeah, 18, 18 surgeries in total to put me back together. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So... You were, um, it seemed like, and correct me if I'm wrong, it seemed like God was imputing to you uh, just the, this uh, peace and love. You didn't use those words, but I'm just making an assumption here because uh, you're not in a state of consternation at this point. You're not looking upon your, your dead body and thinking, oh my goodness, you know, I've lost my, my wife. I've lost my youngest son. What, well, how did you feel at that point? What was going on? Well, that was the out of the body. I mean, I was aware of what had happened, but there was a profound peace, a peace beyond understanding, even in spite of what had happened. Now, to be honest, going back in the body and yet that encouraging, oh, I'm entering my temple, I'm entering a, I mean, I'm going back in the body, that was inspiring to go back in. But boy, back in the body, then the guilt the grief, the regret, the trauma, the pain, the physical, you know, all of that returned in a very, very heavy, heavy way. It, it was very difficult. Um, and, and you'll, you'll relate to this. I, I, you know, it wasn't just the initial injuries. Then I developed horrible infections. And then I threw not one, but two pulmonary emboli or the blood clots that, you know, and they lodged in my lungs as well. Uh, the, the, the trauma in the body, um, was intense, but I was holding on to the contrast of, wow, this is very real, but, but this is the duality. This is the illusion because I just experienced something that was far more real than, 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 than what I thought was reality. If, if that makes any sense. Makes perfect sense. You were, you were introduced uh, when people say, and we've heard this commonly, and I have said it myself, that heaven is more real than this world, uh, that duality you mentioned is something that's a conundrum to people. They don't really understand. How can that be? How can, how can the spiritual realm be more real than the physical? So ex if you will, explain that a little bit, because not that it's ex explainable. I, uh, it's for the most part probably inexplicable, but that you were in instantly in your body again 
The reality though, apart from your body and spirit was more real in what way than the pain and the starkness of what you found oh, yourself wow. in. You know, I'm, I'm going to share what happened to me in the hospital and this might assist in defining that because that, that's a beautiful question. That's a tough question, but I'm happy to answer that. And, and yes, I was in the hospital for many months. I think it's interesting to point out that my two most profound experiences, however, were at the scene of the accident, you know, before all the narcotics had been administered. I was on morphine and everything else in the hospital. But at the end of my hospital stay, I had I had I was out of ICU, I was out of surgical recovery, I was actually in the real rehabilitation wing. And I was healing, I was getting better, and I, I knew I was gonna make it and go home. Um, a profound thing happened. This was at night, and and you know, you you introduced me as a brother, and I love that because we we are brothers my own brothers, my flesh and blood siblings, my, my brothers stood by me in such a way. In fact, my younger brother was with me this very night. He was going to sit with me till I fell asleep. I was still grieving miserably. I was still struggling, but I was, I was going to make it. I was living and I was going to be coming home. I was only weeks away from coming home. Um, I learned what true brotherhood is <laughs> with my brothers nearly losing their jobs to be by my side. But this particular night, I, I, I fell asleep and he was teasing me. I, I had laid on my back so long in the hospital. I'd rubbed all the hair off the back of my head. I was bald on the back of my head and mm -hmm. he was receding in front. So he said, hey, between the two of us, we're a bald man. And we, we laughed and, you know, I mean, laughter was a, was a commodity because of the pain and the, the grief. But I, I laid on my side and they'd finally stabilized my abdominal injuries so I could lay on my side. And I fell into a deep sleep. And when I say that, it was a peaceful sleep. In fact, I was conscious while sleeping that, wow, I'm, I'm sleeping. And then I felt that light come again, that the same light as at the accident, this light surrounded around me. It was comforting me and peaceful in my grief. I felt as if I was rising above the hospital bed. But on this occasion, the, the, the light dispensed. It went away and like fog lifting off a lake, it beautifully just went. And Randy, I was in, I was in the most beautiful place. Um, you know, people say heaven and, and the, the other side, the spirit world, whatever. Again, words are difficult. The only one word that could even come close to what I was experiencing is I was home. Suddenly I was home. I, I, I felt so welcome. And I, I was alone in this experience at the beginning, but I felt, it felt so familiar. I was home and I, I had both legs and both feet and I began to run. And when you talk about explain the difference between physical and the spiritual sensory, I could feel in a very physical way, the ground under my feet, the energy of this beautiful ground I was running on, I could feel the intelligence, if you will, of my, my calves and my thighs. I, I mean, I was more alive and more, more physical, more, more, I mean, almost sensual is the word, like I could feel it and, and I was a part of it. And, and, and as I ran about gleefully thinking I'm home and I'm whole, I'm whole. And when I say that, it felt physically whole, both legs, both feet, but emotionally whole, healed. And, and I was, I was, I began to run. I, I'd been, I had been an athlete, you know, before the accident. And I, I don't run now with the injuries I have, but I was running and it felt very physical. And as I did, I, I had this knowing this message, you're, you're not here to stay. And, and right at that point, there was this corridor up to my right. And I knew intuitively, oh, I'm to go this way. And, and I did, I, I began to make my way down the corridor. And at the end of the corridor was a crib. And Griffin, my little boy had been sleeping in a crib at only 14 months old. And I was curious and I raced to the crib. And, and I looked in it and there, there was my little boy. There was my beautiful little Griffin. That was his name, it's Griffin. And he, he was magnificent. 
I, I swept him up in my arms. And I, I don't know if you've ever picked up a sleeping child. Yes, it's very precious. Yes. Yeah, there's, 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 it's precious. And, 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 and physically, and this is where I'm, I'm attempting to answer the question, the heat and the weight of him was there, you know, when you pick him up and I could feel him solid against me. And, and I could feel him breathing. I mean, I'm not like he, he's, he's a well, he's as whole as I am. He didn't, he's not dead. He's, he lives, he's here. I'm holding him. I could feel him. And I, I could even feel his breath on my neck. And, you know, those senses, wow, I can feel his breath. And I leaned over and I, I smelled his hair. And I don't know if you've ever smelled the hair of a loved one. Um, it, it was the senses were expanded. It was more physical, more real than than this existence or this realm. They, they were I could I could taste his hair, even though I was smelling it. I could I could experience the life and the light in every cell of his body, and yet we necessarily weren't in bodies, but it felt as if we were. And I'm I'm not pretending that. He's a baby in that other realm, but I, I think God is so good. Do you think that, do you think, Jeff, that, that God may have been assuaging your grief? Oh, that I, is I giving you that. peace. You had seen your wife. Yeah. Uh, and she was alive and beautiful, not yeah. marked by injury. You had seen yeah. your son and he was alive Alive and, and well. full of life. Yeah. And I got to hold him. And when I say God is so good, he, he knew I needed to hold my little boy. And, and this, it was being, it was, I was experiencing it in a very profound way. As I held him, I began to weep thinking, wow, I really get to hold him. I get to tell him goodbye too. And I felt, I felt a profound, powerful presence behind me. And it, it was coming closer and closer as I held my little boy, and, and I knew what I feel is God. Um, all that magnificence coming up behind me, and, and the interesting thing is I began to feel the guilt, and, and I don't know how to explain this, but I'll just explain it. It began to bubble up in me, wow, my little boy's life was cut short because I dozed off at the wheel and crashed the car. You know, he's here because I messed up, and and wrecked, and 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 as this presence was coming closer and closer, I, I, I the guilt, and I and I, you know, why, again that why can't I have that three seconds back? And I, I had this thought as the presence came closer and closer. I had the thought, I hope there's some way I can be forgiven, and that's when the magnificent happened. And this almost felt physical too, as I as I had that thought, and I'm holding my child. These divine arms wrapped around both of us and held us, and, and that's when the whole roof came off. It, the, the whole lid. There was just this downpour of love, of peace, of of connection, of, of love, of love in such an unconditional way. Wow. And. And communication, which was almost nonverbal. I mean, it just, I, it was in every, in every sensory I have, I was told there's nothing to forgive. Everything's in perfect order and, and you are as beloved as the child you hold. And yet it was magnified. Here I am holding my little boy who to me is perfect. I mean, he's, he hung the moon and, and yet I'm feeling this love from God that, and it was a very personal experience that I was that loved, but I knew it rippled out that I love my children so magnificently. As you hold your little boy, that, that's how much you're loved. And, and, um, and it felt as if the entire universe was watching this, was witnessing this and, and bearing witness of the love of God, not only for me, but for all of us. It, it was profound. What you're sharing is imparting that love of God to all of us. So indeed, that feeling that you had 
back then, uh, it is, Jeff, absolutely true because that's what's happening now. We so much underestimate the love of God, don't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I had all my life and my beliefs, I had made it conditional. Well, if I do this, this, and this, then God will love me. And, and, and I, as I'm held by God, I had what I've learned is called the life review and I'm seeing my life and I'm like, oh, no, 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 that, that was a mistake. I, I didn't mean to do that. And this magnificent God, this beautiful being said, what did you learn from it? It wasn't, it wasn't judging the mistakes. What did you learn? And I was, I, I, well, I learned this and I learned that. And I, I, I said, well, I knew that was wrong and I did it anyway. And God said, that's your judgment of it, not mine. We love you. We love you. <laughs> and, and, and you're there to learn. That's what life is about. And, and as much as you love and support your little boy, that's how much you're loved and supported here. And um, I also got another tutorial on choice. I mean, I mean, God said, you can be mad at me the rest of your life. And, and believe that I allowed your family to pass or that, you know, I wasn't there to watch over you. And that's okay. We love you anyway. <laughs> and I was told you can be mad at yourself. You can judge yourself and feel guilty and beat yourself up the rest of your life. And that's okay. We love you anyway. And, and, and then the most amazing, profound thing happened, which even confused me. God said, I want you to have the opportunity to exercise your will. And I was like, my will? <laughs> it's your will be done. Is that not the case? And <laughs> like I say, this has been somewhat controversial. And I questioned it, my will? And God said, yes, what do you want? And, and, and it was explained to me. You can give your son to me. You can exercise your will and hand him over. And therefore, he's not ripped away. You're, you're actively giving him to me. Ooh. And my wow. will, my will, and this is, this is the part, God said, my will is your will. And your will is my will. That's how much you're loved. My will has always been that you have free will. So what do you choose, my beloved child? What do you choose? And um, in all that peace, and in all that beauty and in all that joy and all that connection, I, I willingly kissed my little boy and I handed him over. I gave him back, therefore exercising my will, saying, God, I trust you. I love you and I know how much I'm loved and, and, and he's in good hands. I'm, I'm going to, yes, you take him, you have him, you hold him. And, and, and. Then I woke up or came to myself or, or was back in the hospital bed, back to the injuries, the amputation, the wheelchair, the colostomy bag, everything that went on with, with my injuries, but with a much deeper insight, perhaps, of, of how much not only I and not only Griffin, but all, how, how much all of humanity is, is loved and beloved by God. Mm. You know that... So many thoughts are going through my mind listening to you, Jeff, because not only did it seem like it was a cathartic process that God had given you and in, in giving you the choice to hand over Griffin to him, but also you had talked about um, the God you know, saying that, I think you would said something like, what are you going to do going forward or something to that effect? Um, and, you know, we oftentimes, I've, I've been in the training field, we, we oftentimes call that the growth mindset. In other words, wow. what am I going to do better the next time after, after I've failed the first time? How am I going to use that as a lesson learned? But what you're saying is going beyond that because Paul actually reference that as the growth mindset. I mean, not, not the growth mindset, excuse me, the Christ mindset, mm -hmm. which is the Christ mindset essentially is one of almost God teaching us how to think more like Christ. And that is surrendering our, 
our will to the will of God. I mean, yeah. he's, you're surrendering your child so that God can take him into his eternity. That's a that's an amazing picture. Well, and I, and I love that. And, and, and you know, again, in, in transparency, when I came back, I'm like, gosh, why didn't I hold on? <laughs> you know, I mean, there were those mm. days I thought, why didn't I just hold on and not go? But, but you know, Jesus, the, the Christ, I, I, you know, here he is going to the crucifixion. And he says, for this cause came I into the world. And, and on a much smaller scale, I mean, on, in my day-to-day -day life and my challenges or struggles, I've been able to embrace that and say, well, for this cause came I into the world because I'm here to learn and grow. And I, I love your reference to Paul and the Christ mentality. Everything is done for me, not to me. And, and that's, that's what I believe God was communicating. Look, this is for you to exercise your will at, at, at a very powerful level to trust me, <laughs> you know, and to trust the divine and realize that you can walk by faith or even by that inner knowing, if you will, that it's in greater hands than mine. And, and therefore I can surrender. You know, the, the greatest warriors I know are those that are willing to surrender <laughs> and, and stop the fight, right? Yes. The fight. Well, that's a, that's the almost an oxymoron, isn't it? Because surrendering sometimes leads to, victory and and certainly surrendering our will to god to christ is a declaration of victory that i now am taking all of my cares all of the burdens and placing them at your feet now i give them over to you now you take them because uh you're you you told us god told us in in, in his word that uh, his burden was light. Yeah. And to hand that burden over to God. And that's what he was doing for you. It's just yeah. an incredible, incredible event that you're talking about. Yeah. I, I love that verse. And I'll, I'll share just a little bit with that. Because again, I would read that and think, oh, he'll make him light, easier to carry, less, less heavy, right? <laughs> now, when I say, hand your burdens over to God and he will make them light. They can be transformed. They can be illuminated to wisdom, to light, to knowledge, to truth. And, and um, you know, there's layers. Yeah. Easier to carry. Yes. Less heavy, but also, you know, when I'm saying, well, that was a mistake or I did that. And he's saying, but what did you learn? I'm illuminating those burdens, those things that you carry to wisdom, to light, to, to knowing, to truth. And that's, that's love. That, that is love at a whole different level that we don't often embrace in this realm. Yeah, so true. You know, that before I left heaven, uh, Jeff, uh, that was something that uh, the Lord told me, that wisdom would be my guide. Wow. And then moment by moment, he would guide me through the voice of wisdom, which was the voice of God, essentially telling me what to do. And, you know, that does remove the burden, that does remove the, you know, to, and it's a whole different approach to life. What you're talking about, Jeff, I think it's a practicum of living, you know, the Christian walk, which is one of, of letting go, of surrender, of one, yeah. not just of asking for forgiveness, but believing that God, uh, is faithful and righteous to forgive us. Yeah, and that, that's been the biggest part of my story is self-forgiveness. I mean, I, I, I'm really willing and able to forgive my neighbor, but I'm really hard on myself, <laughs> you know, and mm -hmm. the self-forgiveness and, and, and the living in the moment. Um, you know, suddenly after the experience, these things that are taught and said, you know, when Jesus said, take no heed for tomorrow, what you'll eat or what you'll drink. I used to think, well, no, 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 I got to have a plan. I mean, I've got to have a, I got to have an outline here. I got to have a, 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 a pathway. And now it's like, no, no, no. If I'm in the moment, if I'm in the beloved now, the inspiration comes. In fact, I've, my pain is in the past and my worry is in the future. But when I'm in the now, when I'm in that moment and open, that's where inspiration comes. That's when I can receive, you know, the, the guidance or the nudges or the impressions and, 
you know, we started there with Tamara saying, oh, hold on, stop the car. She was in the moment. She wasn't worried about the trip home. And she wasn't even reflecting on the weekend we had spent. It was in that moment, the right now. Here's the inspiration. Go hug mom and dad and even kiss them. And I've, I've learned that, wow, in my life, when I'm present, when I'm in the moment, when I'm, when I'm connected um, and considering the lilies of the field, how they grow, that's when the magnificence is obvious or more, real, you know, more evident to me. Yes, because, you know, Chamra, in a way, she knew what she didn't know. If she knew we were going to get in a crash, she just said, don't start, the, you know, don't drive, let's unpack right. and stay. But, but she knew what she didn't know. Somewhere in her inner soul, she knew. But she didn't know that she knew. Yes. And neither would God want to foretell that. Right. Because as he doesn't with our life, oftentimes, you know, that these accidents happen or the diagnosis happens. And, you know, if God were to foretell that uh, crisis event uh, in advance, then of course we would worry about it. We would fret and have, ter you know, terrible anxiety. But mm -hmm. I love what you said about the moments of life because I, you know, uh, you know, I don't, I think you and I probably are, since we're simpatico in many ways, that we are kind of type, at least I'm a type A personality, was. Uh, I, I was, I'm not, yeah. I, I don't know if I am anymore, but I was. Yeah, so when, when, when God said to me that moment by moment I will reveal my purpose to, it was like, what? You know, <laughs> I want a strategic plan. You know, <laughs> give me the blueprint. I don't. I don't want to. Give, yeah, give me the blueprint. I, I want to see. It. Yeah. <laughs> and he does that to us so often. You know, be still and know that I am Lord. Yeah. Psalm forty six ten. Yeah. You know, get still. You know, just trust. Those are the first two words he said to me, and you know, he's building that trust for you in such a such an incredible way, Jeff. I guess because. Everything that you're describing and your experience is apart from the physical reality of what has transpired. You have lost almost everything at that point. Your health, your wife, mm -hmm. your, your baby. And so you have now, Jeff is, was seven at the time. And um, so what happened with him? I'm curious as to how he dealt with oh, this. Spen yeah, this Spencer, is... my oldest son, seven years old at the time of the accident. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and he, um, it, it, what a beautiful story. And I'll, I'll, I'll share this as briefly as I can. Um, you know, when I returned home and I didn't go to my own house first, I had to go to my brother's house and there was home health and nurses and I, they had made a little hospital bed, an extra room. My brothers were incredible. They'd been watching after Spencer. Spencer went to live with my younger brother and his wife while I was in the hospital and he had visited, but now I was coming to his ground. I mean, we were going to have to go to the grocery store and I, I was in a horrible state. My left leg was amputated above the knee. My right arm is in a sling because the shoulders had to be all real built. My right leg is in a, in a, is in a brace and sticking straight out. And the only thing I could do is, is drive a wheelchair, an electric wheelchair with the left hand that was working and then I had a colostomy bag, you know, that I was still learning how to use and control because of the um, intestinal injuries. That's the state I was going home. And I thought, how's he going to receive this? And uh, when we arrived home, I could see him looking out the window, you know, watching my brothers, his big, strong uncles lifting me out of the car. And I had to be lifted and put into the wheelchair. And I began to make my way toward the house there and my brothers had built a ramp and they were emphatic that I learned to drive and become independent, drive that wheelchair. Anyway, Spencer came running out and he ran toward me, but he ran right past me. Hmm. And um, I thought, well, I, I knew this was too much. The, the amputation, the braces, the colostomy, all that's going on. This is too much for him. He can't handle it. And I continued my way toward the ramp. And as I turned to go up the ramp, I just looked to see where he was and he had actually run across the street and he was knocking on all the neighbor's doors. And he was saying, come out, come out. My dad has made it home. Come see my dad. Mm. And, uh, mm. 
I realized that my judgments were not his. And, and he, he made his way around. He threw himself on my lap, which just about killed me because I still had all the, I had all the sutures and everything from the abdominal repair. And he threw his arms around my neck. And, and I share this for a specific reason, because there I was in a wheelchair in this realm, holding my son who had lived and survived. And for a moment, that was no less divine than being in the other realm, holding my child who had passed, being in the arms of God. I mean, here was this little boy who loved me unconditionally. And, and I, I explained, hey, this is going to be rough. I'm going to work really hard to get well, but are you going to be okay? And we, we still laugh. He's full grown now and married. And he said, dad, if you were nothing but a puddle of blood, I would still love you. And we, we laugh about that. But he never had the near-death experience. He never had a spiritual experience. He, he begged for years. He would pray and ask God, I just want to see my mom. Can I have a dream? Can I? And he, 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 he never got anything. He had one dream at about 14. But he's grown up to be so compassionate. Um, and, and I think I'm a weaker soul. I think he's probably an older, wiser soul that came to walk with me to see me through this experience. Um, but we've, we've, yeah, we just recently published what we thought was a children's book. He wrote from that seven-year-old perspective. The book is called Where Are You? And in the book, he's asking his, you know, where are you, mom? Where's my mother? Are you in the garden? Are you in the kitchen? Are you in the sky? I mean, he could never find her. And as the book unfolds, um, he realizes, wow. You live within me. Your soul lives on and you watch over me. You guide me. Therefore, you're right here. You're in the garden. You're in the trees. You're in the mountains. You're everywhere. And it's a beautiful little self-discovery book about grief and healing, but at a deeper level. You know, we're all looking for God. Where are you? You know, for that parental divine love. Where, where are you? And, and if we realize that, that God is right here, living, watching over us, and we're, 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 we're honoring God by the way we live, just like he's honoring his mother in the compassion he lives, that we can discover the divine in the flower, in the sunset, in the rainstorm, in the challenge, in the joy, in the grief, in all of it, and uh, most magnificently in the love. Because God is love, and and that's it's a book of love. Anyway, Spencer's done great, and he's done wonderful without the out of body or near death experience. He was just a little boy, counting on his own grit and and courage to to take it on, and he has been blessed and nourished and magnified in a way far more profound, perhaps, than my near death experience. Mm. Interesting. It, you know, <laughs> it seems like at every juncture, Jeff, that with Spencer and being so strong as a young child, having that, that inner, that, that strength, strength of character, and uh, with the comfort that you were provided with uh, in, with, uh, with your wife and your 14-month-old. Yeah. that it seems along the way that that God was setting you up for, uh, I'm, I'm struggling with the word, I don't want to say success, because that sounds more too worldly. He was setting you up for ministering to others, knowing the grace of God and in, in, on all things. And that, you know, he was there for you, even in the midst of, of these horrific uh, struggles. Because when I when I uh, when we're speaking with you here, it seems like you know you you don't have the the PTSD or or the <laughs> kind of the you know the the scars the inner scars that many have when they go through such a horrendous experience. It seems like you are at peace, and you are um, truly um, in love with. Uh, with God, and they show that love to others. Um, that's very well put, Randy. I mean, God is good. And even in all that's happened, God is good to me. And uh, 
Wow. I mean, it's interesting. I, I didn't feel any judgment in God's arms. I felt pure, unconditional love. The only question I was asked was, to what degree have you learned to love? And wow, if I, if I could show up in this world and, and, and for one person, you know, manifest that, that unconditional love that I experienced, then that, then that would be my calling. That would be my role. That would be my purpose. And um, you inspire me. You know, I, yes, I, I want to be some type of a manifestation of, of the love of God, even in my little small insignificant way. And yet no one's insignificant, you know, that, that smile to a stranger on the street, that might be the biggest, coolest thing you could do in the whole universe. And yet you do it and you mean it. And um, that's, that's what it's about to me. And, <laughs> You know, we uh, we tend to overcomplicate things, don't we, Jeff? Because oh, I, I do all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Jesus distilled the Ten Commandments into two. Yeah. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the second was like, like hearted, which was to love each other in that yeah. same similar fashion. Mm -hmm. And and yet, uh, you know, I think. Um, you know, that one thing that, that I've noticed in interviewing others who have gone through near-death experiences or afterlife is that it challenges the theology of, uh, of many because mm -hmm. so much of what we know about heaven and the afterlife is a mystery still, even in the study of the Bible. So some would, uh, you know, look at, uh, look at their theology and say, well, if I can't understand it, if I don't know it, and it's not, if it's not documented verbatim, then I can't believe it. And yet what God is saying is an implicit way of living that is very practical and yet very profound and very biblical in the yeah. way it's applied. Because if, if um, and Paul talked about this, in Corinthians, he said, you know, if, if uh, when the love chapter, that is, uh, if, I, if I have all of these other things, gifts, and yet I have not love, I'm a sounding symbol. You know, I'm just clanging. I'm yeah. not, you know, <laughs> there's no purpose in it. Because if I have all of these other giftings uh, and, I, and I minister to those with these giftings, and yet I don't love that other person, I don't love have love um, that is in me to be shared with others and certainly with God, then it, it just falls to the ground. I, I love that chapter, Randy. It's one of my favorite ones. I believe it's 1 Corinthians 13. And, 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 and I experienced that, you know, for now we see through a glass darkly. I, I didn't get it before the accident. I thought I did. But I was in so much judgment of others and, and, and life and, 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 and yet, you know, when that which is perfect has come and I was held by perfection, you know, then, then I, I, I no longer have to be in that, in that uh, childish way, you know. Um, I can truly become like a child instead of being childish and, and love deeper and honor higher and trust more. And, um, and it, it all comes down to love. Without love, I'm nothing. I can have all the prophecies and the tongues of angels and, and all of that. But without love, it's, it's meaningless. It's yes. meaningless. Almost sounds too good to be true. And yet it is true. Yeah. Not that God doesn't hold us accountable. So right. you know, well, we can't go out and... And, yeah, uh, no, I'm not going to go rob the bank. You know, I know he loves me. He'd love me anyway. But, but it's an, an account. Thou shalt not kill and uh, all those uh, steal and all that are in effect, you know. <laughs> right, right. Uh, yeah, I love that. I mean, accountability that, you know, people speak. I, I, I run around in these circles of near death experiencers. The life review was an amazing opportunity to be accountable. Oh, wow. Yeah, I did that. Ooh, that was a mistake. I didn't mean to do that. I, I was literally being accountable in, in, in the presence of unconditional love, which allowed me to learn and allowed me to embrace forgiveness and, and also allowed me to experience the love, which inspired me. It's like, wow, if I'm loved that much, maybe I want to be better. <laughs> you know, maybe I want to be better rather than being worse. 
And, and, you know, and yet I, you know, I live an imperfect life. I mean, gosh, you know, the, I, I, I wander about and, you know, I'm, I'm like a toddler. I'm bumping into things and, and I, I, I make mistakes every day, but I'm less hard on myself because I realize that, um, that love is grander than all of that. You know, that love's the most powerful force in the universe and, and God being love and me being love in my, you know, in my way, somehow it, it, it connects us. Mm. It, connects us. it does. It does. And um, you mentioned something, and I'm going to uh, ask for just a clarification on this, because it sounds like, and I, I know your story, but I'm, I'm for the audience's sake, it sounds like you were, the, your life reviews showed some of the failures in your mm -hmm. life but they didn't condemn you. They reflected the grace of God. That's that exactly, true? I was condemning myself. I was not condemned by God. Um, I was condemning myself. And, and I've made mistakes since then. It's not like I walked out of the life review and never messed it up again. Um, and yet every time there's grace, every time there's grace. I, I mean, gosh, life has rolled out in a beautiful way. I mean, I, I, I eventually fell in love again. I remarried, we adopted two boys. And none of that is easy, you know, re rebuilding a family. And, and I, I don't call them my adopted boys. They're just my sons, but we've had challenges and, and everyone does. Everyone gets their turn. But there's this, there's this grace to it. You know, my, 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 my wife says this all the time. She says, are you gonna, are you gonna go through this with grace? Or are you gonna stumble and sink? You know, you you can you can you can um, you can walk in grace and beauty, or you can waffle about and and fall. And uh, I think it's just as as long as I keep taking a step forward, the grace is there to catch me. Mm. You know? You're like the uh, the new version of Job. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. I, I, I wish I, I haven't lost everything. Boy, my son, Spencer was always there. And, yeah, and yet there's this beautiful thing of, of what of, 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 I don't know what the right word is. It's not like, you know, Tamara will never be replaced. Griffin will never be replaced, but there's this compensation that comes. It's almost like the, the, the depth, the depth of my sorrow and grief is, 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 counterbalanced with the degree of my joy and the beauty. And I still have bad days and I cry and I grieve, um, but the tears are less bitter. They're, they're, they're grateful. Wow. I got 14 months with that beautiful angel. That's what a gift, you know, mm -hmm. and, and focusing on what I have rather than what I've lost. Um, you know, God is so good, mm -hmm. so good. And, and, and our, our burdens can be turned to light, and yet there's always choice. If I choose and allow the grace to work its miracle within me, then it happens. If I fight it, if I ignore it, if I, if I you know, block it, then I'm, I'm only hurting myself because it's there. It's there in abundance if I choose to experience it and receive it. Choice. There's choice, you know. Yeah. For God so loved the word that, world that he uh, gave his only begotten son. However, he's not going to take away the choice that we have, the free will. That's right. Um, that's always going to be there. And people, you know, question why do bad things happen to good people? And you're a living testimony to how, you know, the not necessarily the choice that God would make to, to cause that. No but that the series of events in a world that's very much fallen and, you know, and that happens to be on, you know, highways and speeding yeah. cars and all of the stuff that, that happens in the day to day that could very well end up in, in tragedy, that despite all of these things, that there is this, um, there is ultimately uh, this Romans 828 in effect, which is all things work for good to those that yeah. belong to him and are calling according to his purpose. Um, that, that in the end, um, I, you know, I've heard it said before, if it's not good yet, it's not the end. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, so. yeah, I, th I think we, you know, I think we, as Christians, or, or maybe as humanity, we have this notion that, well, if I just do everything right, 
you know, if I, that God will bless me. Nothing bad will happen if I obey the commandments. You know, it's like, well, not necessarily. I mean, look at the master, Jesus. I mean, yeah, he did everything perfectly. And his life was not easy. It was not without challenges. It was not without grief. He wept, you know, at, at, at the death of Lazarus. He, his heart broke. He, 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 he experienced death and crucifixion and, and betrayal and, and persecution. I mean, being good doesn't mean that nothing bad will happen. It just allows us to, to learn and again, maybe walking grace through it for this cause came I into the world instead of, oh, woe is me and why would God allow that, right? Um, so it, it's a mindset. It's a, it's a mindset and, and, and probably seeing the beauty in the challenges. I mean, life is so short. I mean, it's a drop in the bucket. If, if you look at eternity, which we can't even fathom, life is so short. And eternity is so long. It's like we're gonna we're gonna have some really horrible things happen that we judge as horrible, but perhaps they will create within us the wisdom, as you said, that we can take with us into the eternities and say, "Wow, thank God, I learned that. Thank God that happened. Maybe even thank God I made that choice because otherwise I wouldn't know." Right. Mm -hmm. So true. You alluded to uh, the fact that just. Trying, just trying to abide by the Ten Commandments doesn't really get you to the destination of, uh, of being sold out to God. And that uh, Jesus challenged the rich young ruler, uh, you know, who said, uh, you know, what the rich young ruler to Jesus, that is, said, what do I need to do to, um, you know, to enter the kingdom of God? And Jesus said um, that follow the Ten Commandments. And he said, the rich young ruler said, well, I've done that. I've followed them all. And so Jesus then challenged him by saying, okay, well, then leave all that you have behind and follow me. And he couldn't do that. It's the heart felt uh, that is aspiration toward God, the desire to be with God that is foremost um, in changing the have-tos of life. I have to be good. I have to do the right thing to the one-tos that I want to do a good, good thing because... God loves me so much. I don't want to disappoint him. Disappoint him. Yeah, I choose. I choose to be good. I choose to do that, and uh, I love that. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, uh, for this time together. I, I wish it would, uh, didn't end, but like all good things, they they end. But there's there's a continuation here, which is that many will be watching what you shared today and their lives will be changed and transformed as a result of what you've shared with us today. So uh, another way to continue that conversation is through your books and uh, what, what you have uh, publicly in the public domain. So share with us how we can, can find that. Well, you can, I mean, you can follow me on Facebook and uh, Instagram. I'm just under my full name, which is Jeffrey, J-E-F-F-E-R-Y-C, which is my middle initial, Olson, which is O-L-S-E-N. And uh, you can go to envoypublishing.com. Envoy is French for messenger. And if I can be any kind of a messenger of love, that's what I want to be. You can find the books there. The books are on Amazon. Knowing is my memoir. It's, it's both the first two books, I Knew Their Hearts and Beyond Mile Marker 80. It's a compilation of the two with some deeper insights and extended chapters, even to Spencer, you know, growing up and getting married now and what that looks like. Uh, the new children's book, Where Are You, is available on Amazon. And uh, gosh, shoot me an email. You can go to Envoy Publishing and there's a little contact, uh, you know, button. Um, shoot an email. I, I look at those. I read those. And, and I would love to be of service in any way. And, and Randy, thank you for your work and what you're doing and what you're bringing forth and bringing to light. It's a gift to the world. And I just, any way I can support you, you reach out and let me know. Well, thank you, Jeff. And you've been a gift to us. And uh, we will have those links in the, the body of uh, this message. So you can click on those as well. And uh, Again, thank you so much, Jeff. God bless you and appreciate your heart and what, you, what you've shared with us today. Thank you, my friend. We'll talk All soon. Right. All right. Well, 
And the great news is if, uh, if you are indeed in Christ Jesus, be of good cheer because heaven is in your future. Take care and God bless. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe. And if you'd like further information, go to our website at randyk.org, where our mission is simple, to share the great news of God's love.